Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 566, Circumstantial Evidence. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well, although I just left the Craftlet Zoom call on Thursday nights. And Toshi was there, which, like, we never get Toshi to show up. So that was really cool. And then I had to leave. But, you know, the party rages on. Even without me. Which is really awesome. So, again... If you ever want to, swing by. I mean, the core group has now been meeting for, what, a year, almost a year and a half. So I'm sure it feels like it's a big old click. But truly, people show up. If they can't get a word in edgewise, which sometimes happens, type into the chat. Let us know what books you want to share, what thing you want to show. If we know that you've got something to show everybody, like something that you're knitting or crocheting or making or building then it's super easy to say, hey, you, show us your stuff. But yeah, don't hesitate to join in. I'll make sure that the link to that is in the show notes again. And I am recording on a Thursday night because tomorrow is going to be a dumpster fire. As you may know, cases are going up all over the place, and Pennsylvania announced 13,000 new cases that came in on the Tuesday after Labor Day weekend. So people were busy. Uh, which means that we are busily hiring and training three times as many people as we thought we were going to in the first place. So it's been a bit of an adventure. But the good news is there will now be four trainers. It won't just be me and my compatriot, Jason. Two trainers who I worked with, they were like training support last December, January, February. And I missed them so much, and I was so hoping that they were going to come back. And they did! And I'm just (sighs) hugely relieved, you know? Because we now have a group, so we can each take some of the burden. So, all good news all the way around, except for the 13,000 cases. In other news, if you are listening to this in real time on Friday, there will be a link in the show notes to a blurb about a show that is airing tonight on the on the history channel the hitler channel it is called 911 legacy and it is about the students from my school they focus on three of them three of our girls who got out safely and who were affected by what happened they were not the most affected but honestly the kids who were the most affected did not want to go talk about it so i mean not that not the kids you're going to see weren't affected. Everybody responds to things like this in different ways. So I'm going to be on it. And as I said to the Zoom crew, probably the weak point of the whole show is that I'm going to look like a jackass. But aside from that, it should be kind of interesting because I think they're going to use my graphic that I drew 20 years ago, almost, almost 20 years ago. The graphic that I drew because my dad got me a photo. He got me access to a photo of the site, the Ground Zero site, when a particular company that contracted with NASA was taking satellite imagery. And they were doing heat mapping and figuring out how hot things were down burning in the pit. But I was able to digitally, you know, draw, it's ridiculously badly done, draw the lines of our evacuation and where we went and how we got out. And I think they're going to use it because we had to, we spent a lot of time trying to find who actually took the picture and owns the rights and all of that. So there could be some interesting stuff, but they filmed, they filmed at the school. They filmed in our classrooms. They actually filmed in the classroom next door to me, but all of their stuff was stored in my room. So I have no idea if they have footage of, of being in the room or not, but it could be interesting. Who knows? It's a shocking shocking to me that Saturday will be 20 years. What a long, strange trip it's been. But there was another uplifting thing to mention on the same topic. 
also Friday night on Apple TV, they're going to premiere a video recording of the Broadway show Come From Away, which if you don't know about it, in the Newfoundland area, there was an island that just took in all the flights that were getting grounded. And so these people wound up stranded there for some time. And it's a musical and it's, by all accounts, really lovely and beautifully done. And the music's great. And Amy from Seattle was talking about it tonight and let us all know. So I thought I'd share it with you because it's the musical side of the My Thing. Thank you all for your support for Tracy. TOEF is going in for surgery, just so you are aware. Going in for surgery on Monday, it turns out to be a bigger and more expensive surgery than they thought because, as you are aware, things like this can change very quickly. So if you or someone you know is willing to uh, help out, that would be great. And again, the links will be in the show notes. But because I am recording at night and I still have to sleep and get up early tomorrow, I am going to move on to the Leavenworth case. So this week, I am giving you three chapters. It's going to be a little long. I am going to be a little short. That's just fine. These are not difficult chapters or challenging chapters, but they are important chapters and probably worth listening to twice. The first one is called Side Lights. So we now get to go upstairs and recover the women, the, the two ladies. So we'll see them for the first time. And then chapter seven is Mary Leavenworth. So she's the first one who testifies. And then chapter eight is called Circumstantial Evidence. And that is the testimony of Eleanor Leavenworth. And I will tell you right now, chapter six, sure, seems a little overwrought. Probably is. It's okay. because. Chapter 7 and 8 are going to set things up beautifully. There will be moments in the chapters today where you are going to think, wow, really? You didn't, you seriously didn't see that coming? Or why would you say that? That's, you know what they're going to think now, right? And the answer is no, of course not, because they didn't watch Law and Order in 1878. So, so, so you know, I had to cut them some slack. <laughs> <laughs> because who responded like that first? That would be me. So yes, there will be, I, I am positive there will be moments where you think, oh, brother. But really, it does all work out beautifully. And these chapters are going to set it up so nicely. We only have a couple little Mr. Grice moments, but of course, they're classics. And yeah, that's pretty much everything. I wanted to warn you not to be judgy. <laughs> about the tone of the chapters. All right, here we go with chapters six, seven, and eight of the Leavenworth case by Anna Catherine Green, read for us by Kevin Green at LibriVox.org. All right, here we go. Chapter six, Sidelights. Oh, she has beauty might ensnare a conqueror's soul, and make him leave his crown at random, to be scuffled for by slaves. Otway Third floor, rear room, first door at the head of the stairs. What was I about to encounter there? Mounting the lower flight, and shuddering by the library wall, which to my troubled fancy seemed written all over with horrible suggestions, I took my way slowly upstairs, revolving in my mind many things, among which an admonition uttered long ago by my mother occupied a prominent place. My son, remember that a woman with a secret may be a fascinating study, but she can never be a safe nor even satisfactory companion. A wise saw, no doubt, but totally inapplicable to the present situation. Yet it continued to haunt me till the sight of the door to which I had been directed put every other thought to flight save that I was about to meet the stricken nieces of the brutally murdered man. Pausing only long enough on the threshold to compose myself for the interview, I lifted my hand to knock when a rich clear voice rose from within, and I heard distinctly uttered these astounding words. 
I do not accuse your hand, though I know of none other which would or could have done this deed. But your heart, your head, your will, these I do and must accuse, in my secret mind at least, and it is well that you should know it. Struck with horror, I staggered back, my hands to my ears, when a touch fell on my arm, and turning I saw Mr. Grice standing close beside me, with his finger on his lip, and the last flickering shadow of a flying emotion fading from his steady, almost compassionate countenance. "'Come, come!' he exclaimed. "'I see you don't begin to know what kind of a world you are living in. Rouse yourself. Remember, they are waiting down below.' "'But who is it? Who was it that spoke?' that we shall soon see and without waiting to meet much less answer my appealing look he struck his hand against the door and flung it wide open instantly a flush of lovely colour burst upon us blue curtains blue carpets blue walls it was like a glimpse of heavenly azure in a spot where only darkness and gloom were to be expected fascinated by the sight I stepped impetuously forward, but instantly paused again, overcome and impressed by the exquisite picture I saw before me. Seated in an easy chair of embroidered satin, but rousing from her half-recumbent position, like one who was in the act of launching a powerful invective, I beheld a glorious woman, fair, frail, proud, delicate, looking like a lily in the thick, creamy, tinted wrapper that alternately clung to and swayed from her finely moulded figure, with her forehead crowned with the palest of pale tresses, lifted and flashing with power, one quivering hand clasping the arm of her chair, the other outstretched and pointing towards some distant object in the room. Her whole appearance was so startling, so extraordinary, that I held my breath in surprise, actually for the moment, doubting if it were a living woman I beheld, or some famous pythoness conjured up from ancient story to express in one tremendous gesture the supreme indignation of outraged womanhood miss mary leavenworth whispered that ever-present voice over my shoulder ah mary leavenworth what a relief came with this name this beautiful creature then was not the eleanor who could load aim and fire a pistol Turning my head, I followed the guiding of that uplifted hand, now frozen into its place by a new emotion, the emotion of being interrupted in the midst of a direful and pregnant revelation, and saw, but no, here description fails me, Eleanor Leavenworth must be painted by other hands than mine. I could sit half the day and dilate upon the subtle grace, the pale magnificence, the perfection of form and feature which make Mary Leavenworth the wonder of all who behold her, but Eleanor, I could as soon paint the beatings of my own heart. Beguiling, terrible, grand, pathetic, that face of faces flashed upon my gaze, and instantly the moonlight loveliness of her cousin faded from my memory, and I saw only Eleanor. Only Eleanor from that moment on for ever. When my glance first fell upon her, she was standing by the side of a small table with her face turned towards her cousin, and her two hands resting, the one upon her breast, the other on the table, in an attitude of antagonism. But before the sudden pang which shot through me at the sight of her beauty had subsided, her head had turned, her gaze had encountered mine. All the horror of the situation had burst upon her, and instead of a haughty woman, drawn up to receive and trample upon the insinuations of another, I beheld, alas, a trembling, panting human creature, conscious that a sword hung above her head, and without a word to say why it should not fall and slay her. It was a pitiable change, a heart-rending revelation. I turned from it as from a confession. But just then her cousin, who had apparently regained her self-possession at the first betrayal of emotion on the part of the other, stepped forward, and, holding out her hand, inquired, "'Is not this Mr. Raymond? How kind of you, sir! And you?' turning to Mr. Grice. "'You have come to tell us we are wanted below. Is it not so?' It was the voice I had heard through the door, but modulated to a sweet, winning, almost caressing tone. Glancing hastily at Mr. Grice, I looked to see how he was affected by it. 
evidently much, for the bow with which he greeted her words was lower than ordinary, and the smile with which he met her earnest look both deprecatory and reassuring. His glance did not embrace her cousin, though her eyes were fixed upon his face with an inquiry in their depths more agonising than the utterance of any cry would have been. Knowing Mr. Grice as I did, I felt that nothing could promise worse or be more significant than this transparent disregard of one who seemed to fill the room with her terror. And, struck with pity, I forgot that Mary Leavenworth had spoken, forgot her very presence, in fact, and, turning hastily away, took one step towards her cousin, when Mr. Grice's hand falling on my arm stopped me. "'Miss Leavenworth speaks,' said he. Recalled to myself, I turned my back upon what had so interested me, even while it repelled, and, forcing myself to make some sort of reply to the fair creature before me, offered my arm and led her towards the door. Immediately the pale, proud countenance of Mary Leavenworth softened, almost to the point of smiling. And here, let me say, there never was a woman who could smile, and not smile, like Mary Leavenworth. Looking in my face, with a frank and sweet appeal in her eyes, she murmured, "'You are very good. I do feel the need of support. The occasion is so horrible. And my cousin there—' here a little gleam of alarm nickered into her eyes, is so very strange to-day. Hm, I thought to myself, where is the grand indignant pythoness, with the unspeakable wrath and menace in her countenance, whom I saw when I first entered the room? Could it be that she was trying to beguile us from our conjectures by making light of her former expressions? Or was it possible she deceived herself, so far as to believe as unimpressed by the weighty accusation overheard by us at a moment so critical. But Eleanor Leavenworth, leaning on the arm of the detective, soon absorbed all my attention. She had regained by this time her self-possession also, but not so entirely as her cousin. Her step faltered as she endeavoured to walk, and the hand which rested on his arm trembled like a leaf. "'Would to God I had never entered this house!' said I to myself. And yet, before the exclamation was half uttered, I became conscious of a secret rebellion against the thought, an emotion, shall I say, of thankfulness, that it had been myself rather than another who had been allowed to break in upon their privacy, overhear that significant remark, and, shall I acknowledge it, follow Mr. Grice on the trembling, swaying figure of Eleanor Leavenworth downstairs. Not that I felt the least relenting in my soul towards guilt. Crime had never looked so black. Revenge, selfishness, hatred, cupidity, never seemed more loathsome. And yet, but why enter into the consideration of my feelings at that time? They cannot be of interest. Besides, who can fathom the depths of his own soul, or untangle for others, the secret cords of revulsion and attraction which are, and ever have been, a mystery and wonder to himself? Enough that, supporting upon my arm the half-fainting form of one woman, but with my attention and interest devoted to another, I descended the stairs of the Leavenworth mansion, and re-entered the dreaded presence of those inquisitors of the law who had been so impatiently awaiting us. As I once more crossed that threshold, and faced the eager countenances of those I had left so short a time before, I felt as if ages had elapsed in the interval. So much can be experienced by the human soul in the short space of a few overweighted moments. End of chapter six. Chapter seven. Mary Leavenworth. For this relief, much thanks. Hamlet. Have you ever observed the effect of the sunlight bursting suddenly upon the earth from behind a mass of heavily surcharged clouds? If so, you can have some idea of the sensation produced in that room by the entrance of these two beautiful ladies. Possessed of a loveliness which would have been conspicuous in all places and under all circumstances, Mary at least, if not her less striking, though by no means less interesting cousin, could never have entered any assemblage without drawing to herself the wandering attention of all present. But, heralded as here by the most fearful of tragedies, 
what could you expect from a collection of men such as I have already described, but an overmastering wonder and incredulous admiration? Nothing, perhaps, and yet at the first murmuring sound of amazement and satisfaction I felt my soul recoil in disgust. Making haste to seat my now trembling companion in the most retired spot I could find, I looked around for her cousin, but Eleanor Leavenworth, weak as she had appeared in the interview above, showed at this moment neither hesitation nor embarrassment. Advancing upon the arm of the detective, whose suddenly assumed air of persuasion in the presence of the jury was anything but reassuring, she stood for an instant gazing calmly upon the scene before her then bowing to the coroner with a grace and condescension which seemed at once to place him on the footing of a politely endured intruder in this home of elegance, she took the seat which her own servants hastened to procure for her, with an ease and dignity that rather recalled the triumphs of the drawing-room than the self-consciousness of a scene such as that in which we found ourselves. Palpable acting, though this was, it was not without its effect instantly the murmurs ceased the obtrusive glances fell and something like a forced respect made itself visible upon the countenances of all present even i impressed as i had been by her very different demeanour in the room above experienced a sensation of relief and was more than startled when upon turning to the lady at my side i beheld her eyes riveted upon her cousin with an inquiry in their depths that was anything but encouraging Fearful of the effect this look might have upon those about us, I hastily seized her hand, which, clenched and unconscious, hung over the edge of her chair, and was about to beseech her to have care, when her name, called in a slow, impressive way by the coroner, roused her from her abstraction. Hurriedly withdrawing her gaze from her cousin, she lifted her face to the jury, and I saw a gleam pass over it which brought back my early fancy of the pythoness but it passed, and it was with an expression of great modesty she settled herself to respond to the demand of the coroner, and answer the first few opening inquiries. But what can express the anxiety of that moment to me? Gentle as she now appeared, she was capable of great wrath, as I knew. Was she going to reiterate her suspicions here? Did she hate as well as mistrust her cousin? Would she dare assert in this presence— and before the world, what she found it so easy to utter in the privacy of her own room, and the hearing of the one person concerned, did she wish to? Her own countenance gave me no clue to her intentions, and, in my anxiety, I turned once more to look at Eleanor. But she, in a dread and apprehension I could easily understand, had recoiled at the first intimation that her cousin was to speak, and now sat with her face covered from sight, by hands blanched to an almost deathly whiteness. The testimony of Mary Leavenworth was short. After some few questions, mostly referring to her position in the house, and her connection with its deceased master, she was asked to relate what she knew of the murder itself, and of its discovery by her cousin and the servants. Lifting up a brow that seemed never to have known till now the shadow of care or trouble, and a voice that, whilst low and womanly, rang like a bell through the room, she replied, "'You ask me, gentlemen, a question which I cannot answer of my own personal knowledge. I know nothing of this murder, nor of its discovery, save what has come to me through the lips of others.' My heart gave a bound of relief, and I saw Eleanor Leavenworth's hands drop from her brow like stone, while a flickering gleam as of hope fled over her face, and then died away like sunlight leaving marble. "'For, strange as it may seem to you,' Mary earnestly continued, the shadow of a past horror revisiting her countenance, "'I did not enter the room where my uncle lay. I did not even think of doing so. My only impulse was to fly from what was so horrible and heart-rending. But Eleanor went in, and she can tell you.' "'We will question Miss Eleanor Leavenworth later,' interrupted the coroner, but very gently for him. Evidently the grace and elegance of this beautiful woman were making their impression. "'What we want to know is what you saw. You say you cannot tell us of anything that passed in the room at the time of the discovery?' "'No, sir.' "'Only what occurred in the hall?' 
"'Nothing occurred in the hall,' she innocently remarked. "'Did not the servants pass in from the hall, and your cousin come out there after her revival from her fainting fit?' Mary Leavenworth's violet eyes opened wonderingly. "'Yes, sir, but that was nothing.' "'You remember, however, her coming into the hall?' "'Yes, sir.' "'With the paper in her hand?' "'Paper?' and she wheeled suddenly and looked at her cousin. "'Did you have a paper, Eleanor?' The moment was intense. Eleanor Leavenworth, who at the first mention of the word paper had started perceptibly, rose to her feet at this naive appeal, and opening her lips seemed about to speak, when the coroner, with a strict sense of what was regular, lifted his hand with decision and said, "'You need not ask your cousin, miss, but let us hear what you have to say yourself.' Immediately Eleanor Leavenworth sank back, a pink spot breaking out on either cheek, while a slight murmur testified to the disappointment of those in the room, who were more anxious to have their curiosity gratified than the forms of law adhered to. Satisfied with having done his duty and disposed to be easy with so charming a witness, the coroner repeated his question. "'Tell us, if you please, if you saw any such thing in her hand.' "'I, oh, no, no, I saw nothing.' Being now questioned in relation to the events of the previous night, she had no new light to throw upon the subject. She acknowledged her uncle to have been a little reserved at dinner, but no more so than at previous times, when annoyed by some business anxiety. Asked if she had seen her uncle again that evening, she said no, that she had been detained in her room, that the sight of him sitting in his seat at the head of the table was the very last remembrance she had of him. There was something so touching, so forlorn, and yet so unobtrusive in this simple recollection of hers, that a look of sympathy passed slowly around the room. I even detected Mr. Grice softening towards the inkstand, but Eleanor Leavenworth sat unmoved. "'Was your uncle on ill terms with any one?' was now asked. "'Had he valuable papers, or secret sums of money in his possession?' To all these inquiries she returned an equal negative. "'Has your uncle met any stranger lately, or received any important letter during the last few weeks, which might seem in any way to throw light upon this mystery?' There was the slightest perceptible hesitation in her voice, as she replied, "'No, not to my knowledge. I don't know of any such.' But here, stealing a side glance at Eleanor, she evidently saw something that reassured her, for she hastened to add, "'I believe I may go further than that, and meet your question with a positive no. My uncle was in the habit of confiding in me, and I should have known if anything of importance to him had occurred.' Questioned in regard to Hannah, she gave that person the best of characters, knew of nothing which could have led either to her strange disappearance or to her connection with crime, could not say whether she kept any company or had any visitors, only knew that no one with any such pretensions came to the house. Finally, when asked when she had last seen the pistol, which Mr. Leavenworth always kept in his stand drawer, she returned not since the day he bought it, Eleanor and not herself having the charge of her uncle's apartments. It was the only thing she had said which, even to a mind freighted like mine, would seem to point to any private doubt or secret suspicion and this, uttered in the careless manner in which it was, would have passed without comment if Eleanor herself had not directed at that moment a very much aroused and inquiring look upon the speaker. But it was time for the inquisitive juror to make himself heard again. Edging to the brink of the chair, he drew in his breath, with a vague awe of Mary's beauty, almost ludicrous to see, and asked if she had properly considered what she had just said. "'I hope, sir, I consider all I am called upon to say at such a time as this,' was her earnest reply. The little juror drew back, and I looked to see her examination terminate, when suddenly his ponderous colleague of the watch-chain, catching the young lady's eye, inquired, "'Miss Leavenworth, did your uncle ever make a will?' Instantly every man in the room was in arms, and even she could not prevent the slow blush of injured pride from springing to her cheek but her answer was given firmly, and without any show of resentment. "'Yes, sir,' she returned simply. "'More than one?' "'I never heard of but one.' "'Are you acquainted with the contents of that will?' "'I am. 
he made no secret of his intentions to any one the juryman lifted his eyeglass and looked at her her grace was little to him or her beauty or her elegance perhaps then you can tell me who is the one most likely to be benefited by his death the brutality of this question was too marked to pass unchallenged not a man in that room myself included but frowned with sudden disapprobation but mary leavenworth drawing herself up looked her interlocutor calmly in the face and restrained herself to say i know who would be the greatest losers by it the children he took to his bosom in their helplessness and sorrow the young girls he enshrined with the halo of his love and protection when love and protection were what their immaturity most demanded the women who looked at him for guidance when childhood and youth were past these sir these are the ones to whom his death is a loss in comparison to which all others which may hereafter befall them must ever seem trivial and unimportant it was a noble reply to the basest of insinuations and the juryman drew back rebuked but here another of them one who had not spoken before but whose appearance was not only superior to the rest but also most imposing in its gravity leaned from his seat and in a solemn voice said miss leavenworth the human mind cannot help forming impressions now have you with or without reason felt at any time conscious of a suspicion pointing towards any one person as the murderer of your uncle it was a frightful moment to me and to one other i am sure it was not only frightful but agonizing would her courage fail would her determination to shield her cousin remain firm in the face of duty and at the call of probity i dared not hope it but mary leavenworth rising to her feet looked judge and jury calmly in the face and without raising her voice giving it an indescribably clear and sharp intonation replied no i have neither suspicion nor reason for any the assassin of my uncle is not only entirely unknown to but completely unsuspected by me it was like the removal of a stifling pressure amid a universal outgoing of the breath mary leavenworth stood aside and eleanor was called in her place End of chapter seven chapter eight circumstantial evidence oh dark 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 and now that the interest was at its height that the veil which shrouded this horrible tragedy seemed about to be lifted if not entirely withdrawn i felt a desire to fly the scene to leave the spot to know no more not that i was conscious of any particular fear of this woman betraying herself the cold steadiness of her now fixed and impassive countenance was sufficient warranty in itself against the possibility of any such catastrophe but if indeed the suspicions of her cousin were the offspring not only of hatred but of knowledge if that face of beauty was in truth only a mask and eleanor leavenworth was what the words of her cousin and her own after behaviour would seem to imply how could i bear to sit there and see the frightful serpent of deceit and sin evolve itself from the bosom of this white rose and yet such is the fascination of uncertainty that although i saw something of my own feelings reflected in the countenances of many about me not a man in all that assemblage showed any disposition to depart i least of all the coroner upon whom the blonde loveliness of mary had impressed itself to eleanor's apparent detriment was the only one in the room who showed himself unaffected at this moment turning towards the witness with a look which while respectful had a touch of austerity in it he began you have been an intimate of mr leavenworth's family from childhood they tell me miss leavenworth from my tenth year was her quiet reply it was the first time i had heard her voice and it surprised me it was so like and yet so unlike that of her cousin similar in tone it lacked its expressiveness if i may so speak sounding without vibration on the ear and ceasing without an echo since that time you have been treated like a daughter they tell me yes sir like a daughter indeed 
he was more than a father to both of us. You and Miss Mary Leavenworth are cousins, I believe. When did she enter the family? At the same time I did. Our respective parents were victims of the same disaster. If it had not been for our uncle, we should have been thrown, children as we were, upon the world. But he— Here she paused, her firm lips breaking into a half-tremble. But he, in the goodness of his heart, adopted us into his family, and gave us what we had both lost, a father and a home. You say he was a father to you, as well as to your cousin, that he adopted you. Do you mean by that that he not only surrounded you with present luxury, but gave you to understand that the same should be secured to you after his death, in short that he intended to leave any portion of his property to you? No, sir, I was given to understand from the first that his property would be bequeathed by will to my cousin. Your cousin was no more nearly related to him than yourself, Miss Leavenworth. Did he never give you any reason for this evident partiality? None but his pleasure, sir. Her answers up to this point had been so straightforward and satisfactory that a gradual confidence seemed to be taking the place of the rather uneasy doubts which had from the first circled about this woman's name and person. But at this admission, uttered as it was in a calm, unimpassioned voice, not only the jury but myself, who had so much truer reason for distrusting her, felt that actual suspicion in her case must be very much shaken before the utter lack of motive which this reply so clearly betokened. Meanwhile the coroner continued, "'If your uncle was as kind to you as you say, you must have become very much attached to him.' "'Yes, sir,' her mouth taking a sudden determined curve. "'His death, then, must have been a great shock to you.' "'Very, very great.' enough of itself to make you faint away, as they tell me you did, at the first glimpse you had of his body. Enough, quite. And yet you seem to be prepared for it. Prepared? The servants say you were much agitated at finding your uncle did not make his appearance at the breakfast-table. The servants? Her tongue seemed to cleave to the roof of her mouth. She could hardly speak. "'That when you returned from his room you were very pale.' Was she beginning to realise that there was some doubt, if not actual suspicion, in the mind of the man who could assail her with questions like these? I had not seen her so agitated since that one memorable instant up in her room. But her mistrust, if she felt any, did not long betray itself. Calming herself by a great effort, she replied, with a quiet gesture, "'That is not so strange. My uncle was a very methodical man. The least change in his habits would be likely to awaken our apprehensions.' "'You were alarmed, then?' "'To a certain extent I was.' "'Miss Leavenworth, who is in the habit of overseeing the regulation of your uncle's private apartments?' I am, sir. You are doubtless then acquainted with a certain stand in his room containing a drawer? Yes, sir. How long is it since you had occasion to go to this drawer? Yesterday. Visibly trembling at the admission. At what time? Near noon, I should judge. Was the pistol he was accustomed to keep there in its place at the time? I presume so. I did not observe. Did you turn the key upon closing the drawer? I did. Take it out? No, sir. Miss Leavenworth, that pistol, as you have perhaps observed, lies on the table before you. Will you look at it? And lifting it up into view, he held it towards her. If he had meant to startle her by the sudden action, he amply succeeded. At the first sight of the murderous weapon she shrank back, and a horrified but quickly suppressed shriek burst from her lips. "'Oh, no, no!' she moaned, flinging out her hands before her. "'I must insist upon your looking at it, Miss Leavenworth,' pursued the coroner. 
"'When it was found just now, all the chambers were loaded.' Instantly the agonised look left her countenance. "'Oh, then!' She did not finish, but put out her hand for the weapon. But the coroner, looking at her steadily, continued, "'It has been lately fired off, for all that. The hand that cleaned the barrel forgot the cartridge chamber, Miss Leavenworth.' She did not shriek again, but a hopeless, helpless look slowly settled over her face, and she seemed about to sink, but like a flash the reaction came, and lifting her head with a steady, grand action I have never seen equalled, she exclaimed, "'Very well. What then?' The coroner laid the pistol down. Men and women glanced at each other. Everyone seemed to hesitate to proceed. I heard a tremulous sigh at my side and turning beheld Mary Leavenworth staring at her cousin with a startled flush on her cheek, as if she began to recognise that the public, as well as herself, detected something in this woman calling for explanation. At last the coroner summoned up courage to continue. "'You ask me, Miss Leavenworth, upon the evidence given, what then? Your question obliges me to say that no burglar, no hired assassin, would have used this pistol for a murderous purpose, and then taken the pains not only to clean it, but to reload it, and lock it up again in the drawer from which he had taken it. She did not reply to this, but I saw Mr. Grice make a note of it, with that peculiar emphatic nod of his. Nor, he went on even more gravely, would it be possible for any one who was not accustomed to pass in and out of Mr. Leavenworth's room at all hours, to enter his door so late at night, procure this pistol from its place of concealment, traverse his apartment, and advance as closely upon him as the facts show to have been necessary, without causing him at least to turn his head to one side, which, in consideration of the doctor's testimony, we cannot believe he did. It was a frightful suggestion, and we looked to see Eleanor Leavenworth recoil, but that expression of outraged feeling was left for her cousin to exhibit. Starting indignantly from her seat, Mary cast one hurried glance around her, and opened her lips to speak, but Eleanor, slightly turning, motioned her to have patience, and replied in a cold and calculating voice, "'You are not sure, sir, that this was done. If my uncle, for some purpose of his own, had fired the pistol off yesterday, let us say, which is surely possible, if not probable, the like results would be observed, and the same conclusions drawn. "'Miss Leavenworth,' the coroner went on, "'the ball has been extracted from your uncle's head.' "'Ah! It corresponds with those in the cartridges found in his stand drawer, and it is of the number used with this pistol.' Her head fell forward on her hands. Her eyes sought the floor. Her whole attitude expressed disheartenment. Seeing it, the coroner grew still more grave. "'Miss Leavenworth,' said he, "'I have now some questions to put to you concerning last night. Where did you spend the evening?' "'Alone, in my own room.' "'You, however, saw your uncle or your cousin during the course of it?' "'No, sir. I saw no one after leaving the dinner-table, except Thomas.' she added after a moment's pause. "'And how came you to see him?' "'He came to bring me the card of a gentleman who called.' "'May I ask the name of the gentleman?' "'The name on the card was Mr. Lee Roy Robbins.' The matter seemed trivial, but the sudden start given by the lady at my side made me remember it. "'Miss Leavenworth, when seated in your room, are you in the habit of leaving your door open?' A startled look at this, quickly suppressed. "'Not in the habit, no, sir.' "'Why did you leave it open last night?' "'I was feeling warm.' "'For no other reason?' "'I can give no other.' "'When did you close it?' "'Upon retiring.' "'Was that before or after the servants went up?' "'After.' "'Did you hear Mr. Harwell when he left the library and ascended to his room?' "'I did, sir.' 
"'How much longer did you leave your door open after that?' "'I... Uh, I... A few minutes... Uh, I cannot say,' she added hurriedly. "'Cannot say? Why, do you forget?' "'I forget just how long after Mr. Harwell came up I closed it.' "'Was it more than ten minutes?' "'Yes.' "'More than twenty? "'Perhaps. "'How pale her face was, and how she trembled. "'Miss Leavenworth, according to evidence, "'your uncle came to his death not very long after Mr. Harwell left him. "'If your door was open, you ought to have heard "'if any one went to his room, or any pistol-shot was fired. "'Now did you hear anything?' "'I heard no confusion, no, sir.' "'Did you hear anything?' "'Nor any pistol-shot.' "'Miss Leavenworth, excuse my persistence, but did you hear anything?' "'I heard a door close.' "'What door?' "'The library door.' "'When?' "'I do not know.' She clasped her hands hysterically. "'I cannot say. Why do you ask me so many questions?' I leapt to my feet. She was swaying, almost fainting, but before I could reach her she had drawn herself up again and resumed her former demeanour. "'Excuse me,' said she. "'I am not myself this morning. I beg your pardon.' And she turned steadily to the coroner. "'What was it you asked?' "'I asked,' and his voice grew thin and high. Evidently her manner was beginning to tell against her. "'When it was you heard the library door shut?' I cannot fix the precise time, but it was after Mr. Harwell came up, and before I closed my own. And you heard no pistol shot? No, sir. The coroner cast a quick look at the jury, who almost to a man glanced aside as he did so. Miss Leavenworth, we are told that Hannah, one of the servants, started for your room late last night after some medicine. "'Did she come there?' "'No, sir.' "'When did you first learn of her remarkable disappearance from this house during the night?' "'This morning before breakfast. Molly met me in the hall and asked how Hannah was. I thought the inquiry a strange one, and naturally questioned her. A moment's talk made the conclusion plain that the girl was gone.' "'What did you think when you became assured of this fact?' I did not know what to think. No suspicion of foul play crossed your mind? No, sir. You did not connect the fact with that of your uncle's murder? I did not know of this murder then. And afterwards? Oh, some thought of the possibility of her knowing something about it may have crossed my mind. I cannot say. Can you tell us anything of this girl's past history? I can tell you no more in regard to it than my cousin has done. Do you not know what made her sad at night? Her cheek flushed angrily. Was it at his tone or at the question itself? No, sir. She never confided her secrets to my keeping. Then you cannot tell us where she would be likely to go upon leaving this house? Certainly not. "'Miss Leavenworth, we are obliged to put another question to you. "'We are told it was by your order your uncle's body was removed from where it was found into the next room.' She bowed her head. "'Didn't you know it to be improper for you or anyone else to disturb the body of a person found dead, except in the presence and under the authority of the proper officer?' I did not consult my knowledge, sir, in regard to the subject, only my feelings. Then I suppose it was your feelings which prompted you to remain standing by the table at which he was murdered, instead of following the body in and seeing it properly deposited. Or perhaps, he went on with relentless sarcasm, you were too much interested just then in the piece of paper you took away to think too much of the proprieties of the occasion. Paper? Lifting her head with determination. Who says I took a piece of paper from the table? 
one witness has sworn to seeing you bend over the table upon which several papers lay strewn another to meeting you a few minutes later in the hall just as you were putting a piece of paper into your pocket the inference follows miss leavenworth this was a home thrust and we looked to see some show of agitation but her haughty lip never quivered you have drawn the inference and you must prove the fact the answer was stateliness itself and we were not surprised to see the coroner look a trifle baffled but recovering himself he said miss leavenworth i must ask you again whether you did or did not take anything from that table she folded her arms i decline answering the question she quietly said pardon me he rejoined it is necessary that you should her lip took a still more determined curve when any suspicious paper is found in my possession it will be time enough then for me to explain how i came by it this defiance seemed to quite stagger the coroner do you realize to what this refusal is liable to subject you to she dropped her head i am afraid that i do yes sir mr gryce lifted his hand and softly twirled the tassel of the window curtain and you still persist she absolutely disdained to reply the coroner did not press it further it had now become evident to all that eleanor leavenworth not only stood on her defence but was perfectly aware of her position and prepared to maintain it even her cousin who until now had preserved some sort of composure began to show signs of strong and uncontrollable agitation as if she found it one thing to utter an accusation herself and quite another to see it mirrored in the countenances of the men about her miss leavenworth the coroner continued changing the line of attack you have always had free access to your uncle's apartments have you not yes sir might even have entered his room late at night crossed it and stood at his side without disturbing him sufficiently to cause him to turn his head yes her hands pressing themselves painfully together miss leavenworth the key to the library door is missing she made no answer it has been testified to that previous to the actual discovery of the murder you visited the door of the library alone will you tell us if the key was then in the lock it was not are you certain i am now was there anything peculiar about this key either in size or shape she strove to repress the sudden terror which this question produced glanced carelessly around at the group of servants stationed at her back and trembled it, it was a little different from the others she finally acknowledged in what respect the handle was broken ah gentlemen the handle was broken emphasized the coroner looking towards the jury mr gryce seemed to take this information to himself for he gave another of his quick nods you would then recognize this key miss leavenworth if you should see it she cast a startled look at him as if she expected to behold it in his hand but seeming to gather courage at not finding it produced replied quite easily i think i should sir the coroner seemed satisfied and was about to dismiss the witness when mr gryce quietly advanced and touched him on the arm one moment said that gentleman and stooping he whispered a few words in the coroner's ear then recovering himself stood with his right hand in his breast pocket and his eye upon the chandelier i scarcely dared to breathe had he repeated to the coroner the words he had inadvertently overheard in the hall above but a glance at the latter's face satisfied me that nothing of such importance had transpired he looked not only tired but a trifle annoyed miss leavenworth said he turning again in her direction you have declared that you did not visit your uncle's room last evening do you repeat the assertion i do he glanced at mr gryce who immediately drew from his breast a handkerchief curiously soiled 
"'It is strange, then, that your handkerchief should have been found this morning in that room.' The girl uttered a cry. Then, while Mary's face hardened into a sort of strong despair, Eleanor tightened her lips and coldly replied, "'I do not see it as so very strange. I was in that room early this morning.' "'And you dropped it then?' A distressed blush crossed her face. She did not reply. "'Soiled in this way?' he went on. "'I know nothing about the soil. What is it? Let me see.' "'In a moment. What we now wish is to know how it came to be in your uncle's apartment.' "'There are many ways. I might have left it there days ago. I have told you I was in the habit of visiting his room. But first let me see if it is my handkerchief.' and she held out her hand. "'I presume so, as I am told it has your initials embroidered in the corner,' he remarked, as Mr. Grice passed it to her. But she, with horrified voice, interrupted him. "'These dirty spots, what are they? They look like—' "'What they are,' said the coroner. "'If you have ever cleaned a pistol, you must know what they are, Miss Leavenworth.' She let the handkerchief fall convulsively from her hand, and stood staring at it, lying before her on the floor. "'I know nothing about it, gentlemen,' she said. "'It is my handkerchief, but—' For some cause she did not finish her sentence, but again repeated, "'Indeed, gentlemen, I know nothing about it.' This closed her testimony. Kate the cook was now recalled, and asked to tell— when she last washed the handkerchief. "'This, sir, this handkerchief? Oh, some time last week, sir,' throwing a deprecatory glance at her mistress. "'What day?' "'Well, I wish I could forget, Miss Eleanor, but I can't. It is the only one like it in the house. I washed it the day before yesterday.' "'When did you iron it?' "'Yesterday morning,' half choking over the words. "'And when did you take it to her room?' The cook threw her apron over her head. "'Yesterday afternoon, with the rest of the clothes, just before dinner. Indeed, I, I could not help it, Miss Eleanor,' she whispered. "'It was the truth.' Eleanor Leavenworth frowned. This somewhat contradictory evidence had very sensibly affected her, and when, a moment later, the coroner, having dismissed the witness, turned towards her, and inquired if she had anything further to say in way of explanation or otherwise, she threw her hands up almost spasmodically, slowly shook her head, and without word or warning, fainted quietly away in her chair. A commotion, of course, followed, during which I noticed that Mary did not hasten to her cousin, but left it for Molly and Kate to do what they could towards her resuscitation. In a few moments this was in so far accomplished that they were unable to lead her from the room. As they did so, I observed a tall man rise and follow her out. A momentary silence ensued, soon broken, however, by an impatient stir, as our little juryman rose and proposed that the jury should now adjourn for the day. This, seeming to fall in with the coroner's views, he announced that the inquest would stand adjourned till three o'clock the next day when he trusted all the jurors would be present. A general rush followed, that in a few minutes emptied the room of all but Miss Leavenworth, Mr. Grice, and myself. Yeah, so, right? Eleanor. Hmm, what the what? Now, obviously, we are very early in the book. We have plenty of chapters to go, so... It being the kind of book that Agatha Christie said inspired her, we can feel pretty sure that Eleanor did not do it. But there's some weird stuff going on, right, between the girls and the inheritance. This all gets explained in more detail later. It's not going to be one of those mysteries that never gets explained. It's good. But it is definitely something weird is going on. And their relationship is weird. And the stuff that our guys overheard is weird. There's a lot of weird right now. It all falls into place. I promise. But in the meantime, you're just going to have to go back and listen to those chapters again, because I've got to go. All right, you have a good week. 
Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Get a vaccine. Please don't get sick. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.